Dave Stevenson, thank you so much for coming in, for joining us in our studio. Uh, I want to start with what we're seeing right now, which is the Championship Series. Melbourne United, Tasmania Jack Jumpers. Uh, we've had one game already. What have you made so far of, firstly, on the court, the, the intensity, the almost rivalry that's being created there? What have you made of the series so far? Yeah, well, firstly, thank you very much for having me in, Olgan. It's a real pleasure to spend time with you and, and talk all things NBL, so I'm excited to be here. I feel like this championship series has got all the elements to it. You know, t two great teams, obviously coaches that are phenomenal. Uh, there's a story of, of the mainland versus the, the, the little island, as uh, Dean Vickerman called it, um, and, and lots of controversy. So the atmosphere is, at game one was fantastic, you know, and I think about uh, Friday night's game. Could it be the loudest game in our history? I'd say it's a pretty good chance to do that. Uh, what are you making of the, the emotions that are coming, not just on the court, which we're seeing, but off the court, Dean Vickerman saying what he said, the way that Scott Roth reacted? You, it feels like this is what sports is about, right? Almost the reality show sort of element to it. But what have you made of all the emotions? Yeah, I've absolutely loved it. I mean, I, I think it adds to the stories that, um, that happen off court too. But it, it just shows how passionate people are about this series, about the game, about their teams. Um, and, and I think whenever you see great passion from people, then you see a great on-court product and people love to watch. So I think bring it on. There are a lot of things I want to touch on with you from expansion to officiating to just different things that the, that the league is or may be doing. Uh, I think a lot of it stems from, I think, the Tasmania Jack Jumpers, yeah. uh, who right now they're at the forefront of our consciousness. What have you made of their three-year run in the league so far and maybe why they're able to be so successful uh, and, and what what have they captured in Tasmania that you can maybe use down the line when thinking about other expansion teams? Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt at all that the Tasmania Jack Jumpers are the most successful expansion club in any sport in Australia's history. I mean, you, you think of all the other sports, no other team has made the finals every year and obviously two championship series. I've sold out every single game for three years. But more importantly is what you're referring to, the way they've captured the heart and soul of the whole state. Um, and, and I think it goes so much to the connection that Scott has as, as the coach and setting a great um, tone for the, for the players who have embraced this community spirit. I think the executive team have done a wonderful job there. But they've just found a way to represent the state in every element and really get some connection in through the heart. So lots of great learnings and I think everyone around the league is taking notice about what, what they've done. What sort of processes does the league have in order to tap into what the Jack Jumpers have done there when you do look at other potential cities in which teams can be? What, do you, what are the processes as far as figuring out what they've done right and, and taking all of those things and maybe emulating those in other areas? Yeah, look, I think it always comes down to listening first before you speak. Because I think if you spend enough time with the people in the community, you understand what's important to them. And whether that's the basketball community or the broader community, and then you tap into what's that element. And I think the whole defend the island of, of what Scott came up with and the, the club has embraced really talks so much about the way in which Tasmanians view their state. And, and that representation of the jack jumpers has really materialised that. And so that's not the story that's going to work for every other city uh, or every other team. But really tapping into understanding what that community thinks and feels about their sports and their basketball, but more broadly their community, and I think that's a recipe for success. So you mentioned it's not the same in every city, and so I, I look at Tasmania and I look at the Gold Coast. Gold Coast is a, a team that all of the whispers indicate that they're probably going to be the next franchise in the NBL. Obviously, there is interest from the NBL, there's interest from the Gold Coast government, they're different from a culture standpoint, Tasmania and the Gold Coast. Teams often haven't succeeded in the Gold Coast when, when any league tries to put a professional team there. What makes the NBL think that one could be there and could be viable in the Gold Coast? Yeah, I think there's a couple of elements um, that we always think about. Is One is always the connection to, to fans. And, and what problem are we trying to solve or what opportunity are we trying to realise? You know, If you think about when we had the Blaze there, uh, there was a 1,000 people playing basketball in the Gold Coast region, and today there's 10,000. So you've already got a good connection point for those participants to think about, you know, little Mary who's playing under nines on a Saturday morning, that there's a pathway that she can then go and see um, great elite-level basketball. And so, 
How do you find a way to connect in with that community? But also to, I think he's not being arrogant that you've got all the answers, that you can come in and place the same model. Again, I keep coming back to how do you ask more questions and learn and listen first before you come up with a plan. And if you do that consultation, um, then I generally think you find some great insights and some nuggets that help shape the direction and the positioning of that team. So Gold Coast has been one of the, the potential expansion teams. Darwin has, is one that's been floated. It, does the league have a timeline on when ideally they would like the next team to be introduced to the league? Yeah, look, we don't want to expand just for the sake of expansion. Um, I think what we've learnt with the Jack Jumpers, we've got a model that, that seems to work, but we always talk about the three elements that are critical for us is strong fan support, strong corporate support, and then ultimately strong government support from an infrastructure point of view, whether that's both the playing venue and the training venue. So unless you've got all those three boxes ticked, then we don't want to expand just for the sake of it. Now, I think we're getting pretty close on a couple of those cities. Um, clearly, the Blitz was a, was a good success. Um, sold a lot of tickets, well embraced by the community. Um, so it's no, it's no secret that we've gone there because we want to be able to test that market in the same way as we took the Blitz down to uh, Tassie, and we've seen that success and we had the Blitz in, in Darwin as well. So I think it's it's getting close, but again, we're not going to rush it because we want to make sure that every new team that comes in is going to be successful from the start. And our sport has had a history of teams coming in and leaving pretty quickly and, and, and not under our watch. Is that going to happen? Uh, so you can't put a timeline on it. So if I say within the next year or two? I'd say in the next few years, it's a pretty good chance of happening. Uh, from what you understand of, I'll use Gold Coast and Darwin as the two because I think yeah. they've been at the forefront. Uh, do they have? Do both of those cities have those three things that you mentioned? The government support, the fan yeah. support, the infrastructure? Yeah, they're pretty close on all three, which is frankly um, why they've progressed um, at, at, at such a pace. But again, in all of those areas, you want to make sure you bed down that support in advance. Um, so again, doing things like the Blitz gives you that chance, but until you really get meaningfully into those conversations and the, the theoretical conversation turns into that specific support, um, that's where we're at with, with both of those and, and a few other places as well. So once we get down to that finite level of support that's locked in, um, then I think we'll be in a position to announce. How realistic is expansion into Asia? Um, and how much is that a consideration when you're considering Darwin as a potential franchise as almost a, a gateway to Asia because they're, they're a port for Indonesia, I believe. Yeah. How much of, are all those things put into consideration and, and how realistic is Asian expansion, let's say in the next five years? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, there's always a balance between what's the best strategic growth opportunity and then what's the right timing. And sometimes those two things don't necessarily align. You know, today in Asia, um, due to the FIBA regulations, we can't put a team there. So we've got a lot of work to do with, with FIBA and obviously all of those federations to make sure we get that success. But when you think about the positives in Asia, being in our well, very similar time zone, the way that um, so many of those countries love their basketball and the role of Australian basketball in the region is really high based on the strong performance of the Boomers and the Opals uh, and the number of Australian players in the NBA and the WNBA in particular. So there's a lot of elements in, in the positive column. There's also some challenges to it too. You know, you've got logistics, um, that are a little bit harder. Uh, you've got different currencies, different cultures. Um, at the moment, they've got their own domestic competition. So how does that all integrate and align? So um, it is some time off, but we're optimistic. And, and all of the, the tailwinds are pretty strong. So we've got a lot of work to do. And, and again, we won't rush it for the sake of it. But I think on, on the medium term horizon, I think it's a pretty good chance. Uh, I find it interesting that so Larry Kesselman, who is, owns the league, also has ownership in... Uh, the two teams that are currently in the championship series, he has ownership in multiple teams. Mm. Uh, that is something that has caused some consternation among other owners uh, and also among some fans. What's the league's position on the owner of the league having ownership in teams and what, what value does the league see in that so that they're completely fine with that being the case? Yeah, I think our, our league position is pretty clear that we don't want to hold on to teams or to have Larry hold on to teams uh, for a long period of time. Um, we think that in the best interest of those teams, in some ways, that, that we start them up and we've, we get that success and, and then we put them up for sale and we transact and, and obviously other owners come in. So, you know, there's certain reasons for each of them that, that are a little unique um, based on all those three. 
but it's not our long-term view or Larry's long-term view to hold on to teams. So the expectation is that any new team that enters the league will more than likely be owned or part-owned by Larry Kesterman, and then the goal will always be to eventually sell that team off. As a general rule, yes. I mean, there's always going to be unique situations that, that we'll look at, but yeah, that's absolutely the, uh, the long-term plan. Something that we've learned about Larry over, well, since he took over the NBL was how hands-on he's been. And it mm. seems as though he's passed on a lot of that hands-on stuff that he'd take care of to you. Mm. Um, what's your relationship like with Larry and uh, you guys being able to, to divvy up some of the responsibilities and you being hands-on with not just sort of his baby, but something that is really important to basketball in Australia and the growth of basketball in Australia? Yeah, look, firstly, I would say how Larry has played such an instrumental role in, in, in the turnaround of the NBL, and so he deserves all the credit. Uh, and I think for bringing me in, um, I can't speak more highly enough of the leadership and the support and guidance that he's provided to me over the journey. Um, we'll always have lots of different points of view, and we'll, we'll argue them out, and, and we'll get to a good place, but um, I think his level of confidence in me has directly... Uh, translated to him being able to play a more strategic and growth oriented role and so he loves driving some of those new and exciting initiatives but I think to have the confidence in in me and, and also a, a phenomenal executive team and leadership team that we've got uh, and I think collectively we're making some pretty big steps forward and then the growth this year you know has been remarkable to see a 25 percent growth in broadcast have 37 sellouts already this year um, hitting a million attendees for the first time since 1996. We've got some great momentum and, and lots of people deserve a lot of credit for that. When I speak around the league, there are incremental changes that I think could go a long way. Um, there are a few of them that some have brought up to me. One of them is starting the season earlier, mm -hmm. potentially a few weeks earlier. It would mean that the season would end a few weeks earlier. I think it would allow for higher quality imports to come over here because it'd give them the opportunity to get to the NBA a little bit earlier once the season ends. Has the league put any thought into potentially starting the, the season earlier to potentially increase the quality of the league? Yeah, we've put a lot of thought into it. And I think you make a really compelling case um, for why we'd look at it. Um, there's lots of advantages that we see when we've got some clear space. And so obviously in, in an Australian context, you know, you've got pretty strong winter codes in AFL and NRL, and, and they're really uh, the shoulder products to our season and so do you start earlier during the finals of those competitions but finish before the start or start after the finals and finish before the start of those seasons? It's a bit of a trade-off. The other complexity that makes it hard to finish earlier is also the availability of venues and particularly in uh, places like Melbourne and Perth where they've got tennis commitments. So that may mean if you're finished earlier that you've got teams who work um, and have an incredible season and earn home court advantage and then not have the ability to play their finals on their home court. So there's some things that we're, we're constantly looking at uh, because we certainly know that the core growth of fans is pretty strong for every game that we have, um, but we do get impacted by what other content is on, particularly at a high-level sport. So we're often looking at our schedule. It's kind of the 27-sided Rubik's Cube that we, we try and work through, um, but that evaluation of the season length and the timing um, is something we're looking at and spending a lot of time for next season on. The the other one is the potential of moving from 40-minute games to 48-minute games and potentially extending, not necessarily extending the season, but adding more games to the schedule, potentially from 28 to 36. There have been whispers that that is something that the league is looking into, potentially making these 48-minute games again. Can you confirm that? Or has there been, have there been conversations about potentially getting back to 48-minute games and potentially adding more games? Yeah, look, one of the great things about our culture uh, in the NBL is that we are constantly looking for ways to innovate and do it at speed. So we're, we're talking about all of those things. I think from a, a, a timing of uh, game length, if you look at all the trends around the world, that all the sports are going to shorter lengths, not longer. So yes, there is a discrepancy with the NBA and that impacts total score and individual player score as well. But we think um, it's a really great niche that we have in this market that you can be in and out of the game in two hours. Um, we think for the younger audiences where they don't necessarily have as long an attention span for families that are our primary audience to come in and know they can be in and out in two hours when you compare that to a lot of the other major sports in this market and they're three plus hours. So we don't have any plans anytime soon to go to 48 minutes. I can certainly confirm that. 
uh, but we will always look at ways in which we can become more compelling and, and clearly given the pathway to the NBA, there's a lot of synergies that we look for with that competition. One of the things that's been brought up to me recently on the back of Xavier Cooks agreeing to a new deal with the Sydney Kings, now that's not official yet, that's <laughs> my reporting at this time, uh, is how teams can compete with the global market uh, when it comes to bringing players in. So someone like Xavier Cooks demands a significant amount of money in Asia, let alone the NBA, let alone Europe. Uh, Are there processes in place within the league to make sure that NBL teams can continue to compete with teams outside of the NBL and maybe even help those lower market, the smaller market teams who can't go and pay extra for a Xavier Cooks? Yeah, I think... It's a really great question. It's one we wrestle with a bit uh, because we are in a global sport and we're a global marketplace. Um, But I think what's really important for us is what's the total package that's on offer for that player? So obviously, uh, compensation is really important, so so we're not shying away from that. But there is also what's the development of the player? What's the environment that they're going to be in? Will it allow that player to perform at their best? What's the lifestyle for that player? And so... Exactly as the, the rumoured on Xavier Cooks. You know, it's interesting that as he thinks about desires to get back to the NBA and, and certainly to, to represent Australia at the Olympics, that he feels like potentially the best way for him to do that is to return to the NBA. Well, that's a pretty powerful endorsement, even though I'm sure he could get higher pay elsewhere. So we don't just look at it through the, the narrow lens of um, the compensation. We've got to look at the whole package. And so a big part of what we try and do is, yes, we're constantly looking at ways to to remunerate and reward those players, but also how do we build and develop up the rest of the environment to make sure the players can be at their best. Is there any concern when you you do see high-level local players or high-level imports uh, succeed in the NBL and then basically get priced out of the NBL? Is there a concern that the league has there that there is so much potential for them to lose their talent and that I feel should be processes in place to try to keep them? Yeah, we do. I mean, we obviously got a, a range of mechanisms um, that help uh, encourage and, and a, a attract and retain those players. So they're already in place and, and how we work closely, obviously, with clubs on that. Um, but we're also understanding of the fact that not every player um, at their point in journey is going to see the NBL as, uh, as their destination. Now, the vast majority do. And I think as a general rule, we certainly attract more than we lose. Um, but we've got to absolutely not take that for granted and make sure that we continue to create the best environment. And so when we talk about being one of the top leagues in the world, uh, we've got to make sure that we act in that way. I think it's a similar conversation with Nextars, uh, where you're not just competing with the NBA G League Ignite, but now more so with the NIL money in college basketball. Uh, what sort of conversations have happened within the NBL as far as making sure that you are able to compete with the financial situation that is happening in college basketball right now where it's all it's it's uh, it's an amount of money that I don't think any NBL team can compete with sometimes yeah it, it, it's a great challenge for us to be to be frank I mean that, that has changed the dynamic in some ways and we're always making sure that we look across the environment to, to understand what are the options for those players but I'd say what was a really interesting insight and I did a bit of research on this that if you think about the difference for a player between getting drafted number one and number 20 is $7 million US a year difference in salary. And so when you put that into perspective over multiple years, then really those players are first and foremost going to look at what's the best pathway for them to get drafted into the NBA at the highest possible point. And I think when you see Alex Sarr, I'm sure he gave up more money to, to go and get an NIL deal or potentially play in another league. But for him to say the best pathway is to come to the NBL and play for the Perth Wildcats and gives him the best chance of being successful in the top end of the NBA draft, that's a compelling endorsement. And so when you look at that difference of $7 million US on a yearly basis and you put that over three or four years um, of, of his deal, then it really dwarfs that difference in between what he might have got an NIL deal and what he gets at the NBL. Alex uh, is super unique example of someone who came here, projected top three pick. Uh, I, conversations I have with NBL teams is that there may be souring on the Next Stars program to an extent, or maybe specific sorts of players, mm. uh, because it's very difficult to get, for example, an American teenager and have that person be effective in an NBL environment. Are there any concerns that 
maybe teams are maybe off the next stars program to an extent or or maybe souring on the the sorts of players that you guys may attract within the next stars program and maybe they don't want them part of their teams yeah look first i think the next stars program has been an incredible success and and well done to all of the team who worked on that well before i got there and obviously this year's class of eight next stars is pretty compelling as you said headlined by by alex r and, and bobby and, and a few of the others but what we have to constantly do is earn the right for those athletes to come and play in the NBL. We don't take it for granted, so we've got to make sure that we create a compelling proposition for those athletes. But just as importantly, to your point of the clubs, we've got to make sure that that match um, is appropriate. And that's everything from on court and minutes and roles and training schedules, as well as off court and the support that we put around that athlete uh, where they live, some are, are better suited to bigger cities than others. Some prefer a little bit more of a laid back in um, coaching environment. Everyone's a little bit different. So we fight really, really hard to make sure that we fully understand what the athlete needs and just as importantly, what the club needs and make sure that we can get that match. And sometimes it works and, and, and we're seeing great success of that, uh, but sometimes it doesn't. And, and we're not gonna be at 100% success rate all along the way, but if we do our diligence enough, then we'll give ourselves the best chance of, of succeeding. And so next year, it might be 10 teams have it. It might be six teams. Who knows? We're, we're in that process of recruiting at the moment. But um, we feel really confident in the Next Stars concept. And if we do our diligence right, it should be a big success. How much has the Next Stars program acted as almost a gateway to the NBA and opening up potential opportunities to collaborate with the league and different sorts of endeavours? How much has that Next Stars program been basically something that has put the NBL on notice and made the NBA almost come to the table. Yeah, it's been an incredible success story in so many dimensions. I think we're now up to 26-odd uh, players who have gone directly from the NBL to the NBA and obviously a, a number of those being next stars. Um, it's definitely given us some credibility around the world in both the agents and, and those emerging athletes as, as they're thinking about it. The NBL have been you know, phenomenal in terms of their, uh, their time, certainly in, in my almost year in this role. We went over to Hong Kong and spent some time with them uh, earlier this calendar year. And, and, and they've loved what we're doing here and we love what they do. And so there's a multifaceted relationship there, of which clearly talent is an important part of those athletes. Um, and as they look to grow their presence in Asia, then really we're a big partner for them. But also as we think about you know, potential for NBA teams coming to play out here, there's obviously uh, the NBA 2K, um, that we've got a team that plays in that league. Um, there's broader events and opportunities that we're in constant contact with them. So it, next stars has certainly helped, but we've really got a longer term multi-dimensional partnership with the NBA and we can't be more excited about it. I wanted to ask about officiating in the NBL. It's something that gets brought up to me uh, ad nauseum from uh, league, from from owners around the league, from administrators, from players, from coaches. Uh, what's the NBL's general view on the the performance and quality of the officiating this season? Yeah, but before I answer that, I'll give you a bit of context of having worked in a few other sports. Um, I have never seen a sport around the world that officiating becomes a smooth, seamless process. Um, there is always speculation, there's opinions, it's a very subjective consideration. So one, I think what's defining what success is, uh, we'll, we'll, we will always have challenges around officiating. So um, as a context, I think that's important, but I feel really proud and great with the level of um, on-court officiating. Are they perfect? Absolutely not. Uh, but are they doing a really great job? I absolutely agree and I'll support them all the way. Uh, they have an incredible diligence around analysis, both in game and after game, in that as soon as they finish a game, they get a, a video cut from Scott Butler and the team that analyzes every decision, every non-decision, uh, every questionable decision, uh, and they use that to improve and get better. And so I really think about the NB NBL's officiating team in exactly the same way as you think about a on-court NBL team because high performance environment, lots of feedback, um, lots of subjectivity. Um, neither of them are perfect, but I, I think they're doing a great job and we're always trying to find ways for them to get better. And so we're driving hard of how, how can we get better? What's the better 
pr talent programs, we can identify them, how do we develop them better, um, how do we support them, but most importantly is how do we have great dialogue between the players, coaches and, and the referees, and that's really important for me. So I think you're right in that leagues around the world, the, the officials become the centre of the criticism. Uh, it, it, I've, I'm not sure if I've ever seen it be so widespread among those within the league uh, that it is an issue and quite a fundamental one. Have have you received complaints? Of course, complaints. But what's the level of complaints and, and sort of reviews that you've received from teams around the league with regard to what they perceive as a, a low quality of officiating? Yeah, look, as it, it, a general rule, I get lots of feedback on, on the referees and, and, in fact, all elements of, of the NBL. That's kind of the face of it. You know, you, you need to be able to own all those great things as well as the challenges. Um, there's definitely pockets um, of people who don't love our refereeing and we're not shying away from that. And, and they've been both privately and publicly uh, pretty direct in their points of view. And we listen and I think in, in some ways they've got some merit. Um, but importantly, what we always try and do is take it back to fact-based. And so the analysis, analysis that the team do in looking at all of those decisions and looking at that success rate generally says that they get a hell of a lot more right than wrong. Um, but then you don't hear from some coaches and clubs uh, or owners at all. And so it really is a, a pretty broad, broad spectrum on that feedback. Uh, but again, we're, we're certainly not resting on our laurels. We've got a lot of ways that we want to get better in refereeing and, and officiating, and we're really passionate about supporting them. What was it like when Adam Ford gave a monologue in a press mm -hmm. conference uh, that was directed at you uh, sarcastically, it was, it, but it was pointed enough. Uh, what was your reaction to that? Yeah, look, I think it comes with the territory. You know, as much as you can be the one who goes and celebrates the, the millionth fan coming, you also have to be the face of the league when things don't go as well. And so, you know, what I love about Adam is his passion. Um, he cares a lot about his team and he cares about that performance. And we've had lots of private conversations, you know, before and and post that, um, but lots of public conversations. So I understand that this is a high pressure environment. You know, it's a serious league and we've got livelihoods at stake. Um, so I'll always welcome those conversations. You know, I'd always uh, enjoy whether they're, they're personal um, in a private setting or, or publicly, I understand the, the nature of sport. Another thing that I think that some people had issues with this season was the, the game review panel process, yeah. the tribunal process. Uh, there was the situation with Aaron Baines where it was a one-person tribunal that was supposed to be open to the media and then immediately, uh, then all of a sudden made not open yeah. to the media. Yeah. Uh, there were multiple situations where a player punched another player yeah. and didn't get suspended and then we yeah. saw Marcus Lee uh, in the semi-finals get suspended, yeah. a two-game suspension, yeah. suspended to one game yeah. for what was... I think most people saw as a hard foul. Mm -hmm. uh, are there processes in place or thoughts about potentially changing up that game review panel process? Yeah, I, I don't think at all we um, can sit here and tell all the fans and, and all the players in the clubs that the way that the uh, game review panel and tribunal process has been perfect. Um, we think that there's ways to improve that and so you know, we'll go jump into it in a little bit more detail at the end of the year as we do with all elements of our of our competition is, is to do a review into it and we've already identified some areas that you know, we, we think could be tweaked to improve that. Um, but I also think we could do a better job of educating people uh, around some of those penalties uh, and, and what we're standing for. And I think you know, your comparison of those two is really good. And so things like concussion, that's pretty important for us, that we'll always have a, a, a really important priority to protect the head. And so to educate people that you know contact on the head is going to be treated quite differently and to contact on the body and so I think we can do a better job of bringing our fans and and clubs and players on the journey with that part of that is potentially inviting media into tribunal processes mm -hmm. has there been talks about potentially adding we see that in the AFL and the NRL yeah. Is there a future where the media is invited to be part of that tribunal process to oversee it? Yeah, I think the media play an absolutely critical role in, in the success of our sport because really um, the media tell a fantastic story about the game. And, and it's some things that are pretty obvious and some things you don't know. And so um, any way that we can get the media more involved is absolutely going to be a, an important priority for us. So whether it is involved in in game review panel, um, tribunal, etc. They're all the things that we're contemplating at the moment. 
But as a general rule, um, what you'll see from me as a leader is a more transparent and open process. And I think that allows the media to tell their stories. Now, they're not always going to tell the stories that, that we're going to love and they're not always going to be positive. But again, I think that adds to the talkability that people care so much about this competition. We want to tell those stories. My last question is on the media. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's something that a lot of players have brought up to me, which is the role of the NBL's media arm versus NBL HQ. Mm. Uh, and that... The NBL's media arm often says things about players and it feels odd for some Mm. players to see that the league that they work in Mm. is saying things about them that may be negative, may be positive. What's your message to players who maybe have yet to really differentiate the difference between NBL media Mm. as its media arm and NBL headquarters? And is there maybe a role the league could play in making sure there's literacy out there with regard to the difference between those two things? Yeah, again, it's it's something I'm very familiar with because we had exactly the same challenge at the at the AFL. Yes. So the difference between AFL media and AFL HQ, to, to use your terms, uh, but I think it's even more pronounced with us because the reality of where we're at as a sport, even though we're growing tremendously and and we're seeing fantastic cut through, is that we are still a, an emerging challenger sport. We don't have the broad mass mainstream media coverage yet. You know, at the AFL, there was more journalists who were covering the AFL than, than politics. We're just not there yet from an NBL perspective. So the role of NBL media has to champion and tell those stories. And sometimes those stories aren't always positive about the NBL. Uh, and sometimes they're not always going to be as positive about the players and the clubs. But we've got a big responsibility to increase the level of talkability for our league. And, and when we do that, that translates really directly into more people coming to games and more people watching in broadcasts, which drives more commercial returns, which ultimately helps increase things like the salary cap. So um, I think it's, I know it's hard sometimes when you see the same entity uh, supporting in one way and perhaps making some critical observations on the other, but I think that's the way of the modern world. And, and until we get such times as we get broad mass uh, mainstream coverage, then that's going to be the role of NBL Media and we'll support them fully. Well, look, I appreciate you taking the time coming in and answer, answering some challenging questions. Uh, enjoy the rest of the Championship Series. Great. Thank you so much for your support. We really love what you do. Uh, and also, we're very excited for our fans for a crescendo of a pretty amazing season. So I look forward to seeing it at the game. Thanks, Dave.